This is WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warno Destillet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. A Baha'i Perspective is a radio program that examines contemporary issues based on the principles of the Baha'i faith. Today I'm playing a pre-recorded interview with Mr. Ash Hartwell, a Baha'i from Amherst, Massachusetts. Ash has traveled to many countries in Africa, including Egypt, Ghana, Uganda, and Malawi, applying learning principles to classroom, school, and community programs. Since he returned to the U.S. after working 25 years in Africa, he has served as an education advisor to USAID's Africa Bureau, as well as to UNICEF, CARE, and the World Bank. He has served on the Board of Trustees of the 21st Century Learning Initiative, a transnational program to synthesize the best of research and development into the nature of human learning and implications for education, work, and the development of communities worldwide. In 2002, he joined the faculty at the Center for International Education at the University of Massachusetts, where he focuses on learning in post-conflict situations, educational policy and planning, and alternative forms of education. He also continues as an advisor on education systems for the Global Learning Group of the Education Development Center, Inc. The stories that Ash has to tell are too many to capture in one hour. So I've segmented our interview into three parts. In the first segment, Ash described his experiences as one of the first Peace Corps volunteers and his adventures in Ethiopia for that assignment. Ash concluded that segment by describing his experience as an educator in the Washington, D.C. school system and the start of the Upward Bound organization. In this final segment, Ash describes his work in Egypt and finally in Afghanistan. Well, after Botswana... um I, I lived there almost five years, managed a very large program to expand secondary, junior secondary education in the country, and then got an offer that I couldn't really turn down because mm-hmm. I had always wanted to go to Egypt. And I got an offer to... I'd gotten involved professionally in um, developing and designing information systems for the education program in countries. And uh, I got an offer to... Um, join a uh, a new effort in Egypt <laughs> <laughs> to have a major education reform which was to have a a new entity established in the ministry uh called uh policy analysis planning and information systems and it was to uh it was to be really well kind of staffed with international people and a new staff of about 100 people from Egypt, and it was a big deal, supposedly. Mm. So I thought, okay, that sounds like, you know, a chance to go to Egypt. And, but before making that decision, um, Egypt is a country, as a, as, a, as a Muslim country, with Islam as the state religion, Baha'is have been persecuted from the time that the faith first made its way to Egypt, which was way way back, actually almost at the turn of the century. Um, and Baha'is have been persecuted uh, because the Islam, again, views the faith as being a heretical rather than an independent religion. However, in Egypt, something important happened in the 1920s to change that around. And that has something to do with my story in Egypt, so I'm going to just take that little diversion. Okay. Um, in in the 1920s, there were um, there were some very uh, very wise and very able teachers of the Baha'i Faith who were on the faculty of um, of the Islamic University, um, the Azhar University in Cairo. Azhar mm. was established in the 10th century. It's the oldest mm. and most uh, esteemed Islamic university in the world. And uh, a, a, a Baha'i who was a, a, a brilliant scholar, Abdul Fadl, 
um, was on the faculty and had many followers, many people who believed, uh, and who who were attracted to his deep knowledge of Islam and his also the his his teachings about the faith. So one of his followers, um, uh, well, actually a few of his followers went uh, down to teach at a university an Islamic university in a place called Beni Suef, which is about 150 miles south of Cairo. And uh, they began teaching the Baha'i faith. And they were arrested uh, for being heretics. And they were put in jail and then put on trial. And the issue of the trial was whether or not they were heretics and therefore could be severely punished or whether or not, in fact, they represented an independent religion, which is what they argued, that they were not heretics, that they fully accepted Muhammad, they were not heretics, that they were espousing the birth of a new, of a new uh, movement, not a new religion. They made that, that a continuing religion in which Muhammad was the seal of the prophets and had foretold the day when the trumpets would blast and there would be a new um, uh, the, the, the day of the end uh, but a new a new stage in Revelation and uh, this trial went on for about six weeks including having testimony from Abdul Fadl uh, and, and many others and they were judged to be um, innocent of the charge of being heretics it was recognized that this was not Islam it was not uh, it was not a, a sect or anything uh, or uh, a heresy. It was a new and valid independent religion, mm. and this was the first time that legally the faith in the world, much less and especially in the Islamic world, was uh, recognized to be an independent religion. So it was mm. a very very important milestone. That being said, independent religion or no, it was persecuted mm. um, and uh, and basically banned. Um, nonetheless, the Baha'i community in Egypt has grown and maintained itself uh, to be a very strong uh, community. The, uh, to give an idea of what this involves is that children, when they go to school, at every stage in your life, actually, in Egypt, you're given a form whether you're renting an apartment, or getting a bank loan, or going to school, you fill a form, and on it, it says you have to declare your religion. And uh, that's meant that the Baha'is have had to declare their religion, and for kids in school, that's meant they've then gotten persecuted in the school all their lives. So it makes them very, very deep. They have to understand how to respond to questions and challenges and, and, um, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um in Egypt, um, uh, although we couldn't meet publicly and officially, <laughs> the Baha'is met constantly and had a wonderful community mm. because we met as family. Mm. So I felt very much a part of the family. Uh, we'd have, and we'd meet as a family in picnics with 100 people on a, in an open picnic ground. And uh, when people asked what we were doing, we were celebrating a family event. <laughs> and we, that's what we did. <laughs> so that was great. Yeah. Um, uh, that being said, um, they, did have, um, they did have challenges, and there were people jailed for a variety of reasons. Mm. So. Yeah. Um, my, my work there, though, uh, finally gave me a chance more than in any other work that I had done to put into practice on a fairly major scale things that I really believe in about education. Um, UNICEF asked me, I, I did this planning job, and we helped establish a national information system. I went all over the country with a team of Egyptians to put in place software and hardware and train offices in ministry offices in the governance. It was a fabulous experience. I learned Arabic pretty well because I had to function in it. All our software had to be in Arabic. Oh, wow. Uh, so, and it was, a, it was a major system, and it, it worked. But that, wasn't, that was fun. Uh, but the next thing, I was asked by UNICEF if I could help them uh, initiate a new education program. UNICEF was beginning to get interested in girls' education in particular. This was in the early 90s. And uh, I agree, that would be great. And um, 
and I worked with a small team of incredibly capable and dedicated Egyptians to do some surveys in Upper Egypt in the most the poorest and the remotest rural areas of Upper Egypt. Now, Upper Egypt has the peculiarity that it is defined by the Nile. Okay. People's ability to live anywhere has to do oh, with the irrigation yeah. system. How far away you Nile. are from the Nile. Because once you pass the irrigation system, you can't ex- exist. Um, and um, when the Aswan Dam was built in the 60s, it allowed a greater control of the flow and use of the Nile, and irrigation systems were therefore put in place, and it allowed people to move out another 10 kilometers from the narrow settlements, congested settlements along the Nile. When they moved out, they did it almost like pioneers. I mean, 10 kilometers doesn't sound like much, but these people Mm -hmm. broke tradition and moved to a new place. Hadn't happened for millennia in Egypt. They tended to be kind of pioneers. They also tended to move away because as people who came to America came to America because they wanted to escape debt or persecution in the old world or simply had family (laughs) conflicts, they moved because they wanted to get away from wherever they were. (coughs) And that was also true of these people. So they seemed to, they, they, they were a little different. Now, Egypt didn't redraw any administrative boundaries uh, at all, even though people were moving out into the Esba, the hamlets. And we, our surveys showed that the kids in these hamlets were not getting either health services or education. And the reason why is when you go to the Karia, which is the central town of the administrative area, the, the people there said, oh, those people, well, they moved of their own choice. They they should come here. Well, they wouldn't come there. And so we found that about 90% of these populations were not having any access to to, to, to basic services, including education. Uh, 95% of the women and girls had no education or literacy. So UNICEF began providing health services through community health workers who were young women who were trained to who kind of came from the area and were trained and we started working with them and having dialogue with the people in the communities and asking them what did they think they what would they think their lives would be like in 15 years uh, in 10 years 5 years, how would it get there what did that mean for the education of their children, for their girls and for their boys and what we found was that although we were working in an area which was characterized by by the com- the rest of the country and certainly by UNICEF and the agencies as being um, fundamentalist, uh, traditional, really conservative socially, we found actually quite the contrary. These people mm-hmm. were were somewhat imaginative. They they really could see differences in their future because they were pioneers. We really enjoyed these dialogues. And the dialogue emerged as a way of creating what we called the community schools of Upper Egypt, which were supported by their the mullahs uh, and provided an experience that was somewhat designed, I will say, influenced by the kind of concepts that went into Hanaha Oli. Okay, and I say the kind of concepts because I now think let's these backtrack are concepts. a little bit because yeah. this might be like three segments later. That's yes, right. So well, that's is Oli was where you really believe that the function of a school is to create the creative environment for kids to learn uh, by working together in work in play um, and to help the the kids themselves help to develop the curriculum based on the realities and mm. importance of things in their own lives. And this was your primary school that you went and that to was in the Hawaii. Primary school in Hawaii. Yeah. But I. I want to emphasize that this isn't trying to take a model from Hawaii and put it in Egypt at all. It's based on a set of universal principles about the way children thrive and learn. Mm -hmm. Children are natural-born learners. Schooling, as we know it, often um, suppresses that and says to children, what is important is what you're told, not what you can learn. Mm -hmm. And every one of us, if we reflect back to our own childhood, I think we'll recognize that um, that's at best a (laughs) half-truth. So 
this sounds pretty wild that we're having constructivist schools, as we call them, in rural Upper Egypt, but that's precisely what happened. It was inspired also by work that has gone on in countries like um, Ecuador and uh, Bangladesh, where these kinds of alternative organization of schooling in rural and poor communities have shown that they can work well. Mm. Uh, it has a lot to do with who is chosen to be teachers and their commitments. It has to do with the respect and dignity that's given to the parents to say that they have something to contribute to this. Uh, in many third world countries, parents feel that they have no part of the formal schooling since the content of formal schooling is European. Mm. And they uh, feel alienated by that. In this mm. case, we're saying no. Your history, your genealogies, your traditional knowledge is something that's very important here. Yeah. Um, and to focus also on the tools of learning, of literacy and mathematics, um, by having children learn to write stories of their own lives in their community. Mm -hmm. Lots of techniques were put into this. A lot of training, too, but not a lot of pre-service training, but training right on the ground. We designed a system of having support where teachers work together as peers rather than individually mm. to give the sense that the teacher isn't the source of all knowledge. Here are two teachers, and we're working together. Um, with the with the kids, we also kept classes small so that they would be manageable, um, and provided a lot of materials, uh, including manipulables, things that children, letter dice and number dice that were large blocks, um, scales and things that they could play with, musical instruments. Music became a very important part of this. Mm -hmm. Music that um, used traditional melodies and songs and so forth. Um, used a lot of puppetry, um, but we always kept an eye towards what could be developed and used from within the community. The day looked very different from the school day that we, as you know it perhaps, um, instead of saying first period is uh, mathematics and second period is uh, <coughs> social studies and then we do homeroom, we start out with, um, this was something added, we didn't think of this at first, songs and calisthenics. Sounds Chinese or something. I don't know. But that and that wasn't our idea. This this came out of <laughs> songs and calisthenics. And then we have a town meeting. And the town meeting is when the kids and the, the teachers share things of importance that happened in the community. If somebody's ox died, they ought to talk about it. Uh if somebody was sick and not there, then they decide, well, we ought to have we ought to find out why that young you know, why that girl isn't here. Can we have a group of two um, others go to the home and find out what's happened and then bring back the news? Something's happened, otherwise the girl would be here. Mm. So nothing like truancy. Actually, uh, kids later said that um, it was a punishment not to be able to go to school because the parents said they had to do some work. At home. Mm. So, um, so we had a town meeting. Uh, and then, um, <laughs> then the next class was planning time. And the planning was... Uh, was that the kids individually and collectively, and they had to decide how to group themselves. This didn't happen overnight. They were, but they they actually plan the the learning time that they're going to have, which will be about two hours, um, and they plan that in light of what they want to accomplish in the in the day, in the week, over a month. So they'll have long-term projects, but they, the planning time is to say, how do we go about doing this? What are our strategies? Who do we have to have to help come and help us from the community, from other kids, older kids in the class? These are multi-age classes. Uh, the teacher, some, you know, and they have to figure out how they're going to get help and resources to um, move along on their project. Mm -hmm. um, and then the learning time itself, uh, which was a couple of hours, and then there's um, lunch break and um, and prayers. And uh, after lunch break and prayers, then there's a there's evaluations. Now, evaluations aren't just tests, but the kids actually where when and where they're ready. Not everyone demonstrate what's their, what they're mm. what they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, and they get feedback and critic and criticism. They may put on a little play. They they may actually read a poem. They, they may put on a musical, but they they demonstrate what they've been doing. Also during that period is a time when the facilitators will come around and see whether or not the kids have mastered milestones of learning. And there's a record of, of that. 
uh, mm. milestones are things like I can write a sentence um, at about a certain topic, and mm -hmm. so um, and the, the miles in this program the milestones are laid out. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, <coughs> the two facilitators sit down together to review what they've done and plan for the next day. And the kids, uh, you know, have games. So, as you see, that's a little bit different from the ordinary school, but. After three years of this program, um, the the kids were um, in the in the community schools uh, sat the third grade test that was given nationwide, and they outperformed children at the end of grade five, which is the final grade of the primary, by a a, a major factor. Mm. Out of the first cohort of 120 kids that we had in uh, five schools. Uh, we only had one student who didn't pass, mm. um, and that person had a learning disability. Mm. So this program grew um, first from four, then to 24, then mm -hmm. to 100. It now, it's hard to count now because it's the model and the approach has been picked up by many others, but our estimate <coughs> is somewhere on the order of 1,200 schools in oh Upper Egypt gosh. that are doing this. But it also <coughs> had a big impact on the formal school systems um, because we started inviting people from the faculties of education to be a part of the program, mm. not not to come and be convinced, but actually as resource people. And they started spreading the news. And we invited other teachers from other schools to come to our... By the way, we did workshops every weekend with the, with the mm. facilitators uh, as, a, as a way of providing support. So we did a lot of things that are different from the formal schools. Mm. And, uh, and it has worked extraordinarily well. In fact, there is a wonderful book that is written by what I, the woman who I call the mother of this program, Malik Zalouk, who um, wrote a book called Empowering Education, The Children of the Upper Nile. And it, it, it's a wonderful story. This is available on Amazon.com, and it's a, it's a wonderful story of what happened here and, uh, and, and, and shows the evidence. Mm. So. Very good. So anyway, that program, um, I think, really, really mm. exemplifies mm. that you can, by uh, true respect for the dignity and the and the and the and the ability, the native ability, what mm. the God-given ability of children, um, if that's respected, they are, uh, as in the in the Baha'i writings, they're gems of inestimable value. Mm. They, the gems though, have to be polished mm. and given an experience for them to come forth. But when that environment allows that to happen, they really do, and everyone's a winner. Yes, so, yes. anyway, that. That was one of my really terrific experiences. Mm, in, uh, very good. In my but I, after that, I have become such a believer <laughs> <laughs> in this kind of approach. In, ironically, in the most underserved areas of the world, because those are the areas where there has been so much kind of oppression and exploitation that the idea that people will really be listened to provides an energy and a hope that leads to different ways of thinking. It's my belief. <laughs> and uh, right. not, and, and not my, just my belief. Actually, we are now, I'm involved in a, in a major uh, research project worldwide to demonstrate that this. Mm. Um, and we have completed something like 12 case studies around the world and we have identified funnily enough we identified 151 programs in Africa ha that have some of these characteristics and have about 3 million kids enrolled mm. um, including schools that deal with the uh, devastation wrought by uh, HIV AIDS in rural com in, you know, in communities and they have to come up with different ways of organizing because they're losing their teachers and the kids mm. have to um, uh, can't can't spend a full day at school because mm. of the need to have care for the family and so on. Right. So, right. so there are lots of different reasons for the need to think very radically differently about schooling. Mm. Our long-term hope, and that that is, is that these 
would be noticed by the mainstream systems, and mm -hmm. they can see how effective they are. Mm. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Okay. So that's Egypt. That's Egypt. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe in the interest of finally having an end to this story, <laughs> uh, I will jump across... <laughs> Uganda's recovery, which was fabulous and which I was involved in uh, many times uh, at different stages, mm -hmm. including, as I said, when the uh, when the Amin regime finally fell and the House of Worship was on the front page um, and, and the Baha'is there have grown from strength to strength and the House mm -hmm. of Worship is a place that anybody visiting Africa shouldn't miss going to Kakaya Hill and, and seeing the absolute beauty and joy that you get from the House mm -hmm. of Worship there. <laughs> but um, Ghana, I spent a lot of time in, although mm -hmm. I didn't live in permanently, but I went there twice a year and have been doing for the last, oh, more than 15 years now. I've just come back, actually, from a trip there. Mm -hmm. And like the other countries I work in, um, I'm supporting and documenting and analyzing a program called School for Life, which is for children in the northern part of the country, which has always been uh, 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 a hinterland, a kind of a, uh, a leftover. It has always been a labor reserve from the time, actually, of slavery in the 17th, 18th century, where the north of Ghana was one of the, and across the Sahel was one of the areas where slaves were captured, mm. uh, captured and brought to the south uh, over over a hundred years, and was always seen as a place that you go for slaves. Mm. Um, to then the colonial regime um, of of Britain and UK, where the north, uh, where the north. Uh, basically refused services as well as being hostile to that because they saw themselves as again being exploited and thought they had a little bit more of a voice in it and um, and and that was fine with the UK they basically neglected the north mm. um, to after independence when um, there has been continued conflict by the many different ethnic groups in the north um, and again neglected um, so in the north today, in many rural areas, fewer than 40% of the children have any access to schooling. And mm. I've been involved in helping a group expand, grow and expand that was established by one of the paramount chiefs, a young 30-year-old a young paramount chief who... Mm. Paramount means he's, he's a chief of more than one village. It's I a see. whole area. And he was a very... Again, so many times we see really wonderful things coming out of young leaders who are visionary and he mm. was um, and he worked with a Danish NGO um, but uh, began a program called School for Life which offered the opportunity of youth um, between the ages of 11 and 15 girls and boys to come to a two and a half hour class in literacy and numeracy mm -hmm. uh, uh, based on stories and examples from their own lives um, taught by uh, people they knew but who had, the, had had the opportunity of going to some secondary school and who were given a lot of help on the ground um, starting again small and spreading to now over, um, over a thousand schools wow. um, they only go for nine months and at the end of nine months they take a test and that test is the equivalency of grade three literacy, numeracy, and knowledge. So from ground zero... From ground zero... To in nine months... Nine months... They have third grade third education. Third grade education. Wow. And in the formal schools, about 45% of the kids drop out before they get to grade three, and about 60% of the kids all over the north are able to get into grade one. So, in effect, you have about 30% of the kids in the whole population getting it through formal school. But their performance on literacy and numeracy tests is about 20% mm. less. Okay. Okay? So we're down to a pretty low number 
of kids through formal schools who are getting any opportunity to learn something that is functional. In School for Life, all the kids in a particular village come into the school. If they can't come on one cohort, they'll either have two classes, or when one cohort is finished after nine months, they'll do another nine months and get the next group. 80% of the, well, 75% of these kids are passing this test. Oh, wow. Yeah. And of those, almost 70% are going to grade uh, four. Four. And in the North, over the last eight years since this program started, and it started very small and expanded, so it's mostly in the last few years, over 50,000 kids have entered grade four out of this program, which is more the number of kids entering the program from the formal schools. Wow. So it actually illustrates that this is this is real. This methodology uh, this is working. Is, yeah. I mean this is <laughs> in this case it's quite radically working. Yeah. 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 Well. Wow. So um, we're we're looking at this and the uh, looking at it pretty hard nose in terms of how much does it cost to have a child in school, to have a child complete a cycle of schooling and to learn um, at least uh, what would be considered mastery level mm. uh, in terms of literacy and numeracy. Mm. And our, our, our cases run from Uganda to Ethiopia to Bangladesh and Colombia and Honduras and Guatemala and uh, um, uh, Pakistan. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, it seems the evidence really shows that this is this is very very doable. Now mm. we're not arguing that this is nine months is a good way to replace three years of education. That's not what we're arguing. We're just arguing that it makes an enormous difference how you organize for learning mm. to get to get results. Mm. And we think these results are enormously important um, in the world. Um, uh, one of the teachings of Baha'u'llah is that all children should be educated. Mm. And Actually, it's the Baha'i perspective that it's one of the prerequisites to peace, is uh, yes, universal education. It is, and, and, it, and, and, and the reason is, th- is, if one is not educated in the world today, wherever you are, you're, you're going to be exploited. You're going to be without a voice and without a, without a capacity to engage in the economy and the and politics and the in in, in civic society, mm. you're going to be marginalized. And in a world where some are marginalized and others aren't, uh, one can't achieve justice. And mm. uh, so there is the worldwide program of education for all, um, and and that's very laudable. And it's the worldwide commitment to 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 make every you know schooling available to everybody. But we are arguing worldwide and, and on various forums that it's not just schooling there may be other ways to do this and schooling in fact has not proved to be a good way of reaching the marginalized mm. and so this is this is something that needs to be taken very seriously not just as an isolated project but as something to look like a, as a as a worldwide phenomenon mm. so yeah I work with about 10 other colleagues from around the world on this agenda and we're, you know, we're being asked to make presentations. Uh, we made a presentation last year in Brazil at the World Summit on mm. EFA. And How about and application in the States? Oh, well, you know, people ask me that all the time, and I say, absolutely, you know, let's mm-hmm. do it. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the colleagues that I work with very closely um, from Cleveland works on a program to do this in the States, but mm-hmm. he's also engaged in the international work. Um, we more and more use the term global education to say, you, you know, it doesn't matter. The We're states is a place in the globe. Right. <laughs> um, it's not international education kind of implied you do it over there. We don't <laughs> want to s- say that. We say Hanaoli or, mm-hmm. or schools in Amherst, wherever these mm-hmm. principles and these practices apply, and that's because they're universal. They mm-hmm. have to do with the nature of our um, nature of children, nature of ourselves as learners, mm. and so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now uh, I understand your most recent work is in Afghanistan. Right. Yeah, and uh, that's a little different. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. The, Did I, I skip I, something I, between? Well, yeah, but that's okay. The, well, let's just let's just no, no. mention them, even if we don't go into them. Oh my! Of uh, just the countries. So Ghana was the last one we mentioned. Ghana. Mm. Well, then there was Benin. Okay. And Malawi. All right. And South Africa. Okay. And Zambia. Oh my gosh. And Ethiopia, particularly Ethiopia. That's another story, but. That's where I met Trish, my wife, okay. as I said, in Diradawa, and our first date was Harar. Right. And I've been gone back to Ethiopia quite a number of times. Mm. All of these have to do with... I've been working as, a, as an advisor to USAID's education program um, mm. uh, in Africa and internationally. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I still do that, as well as teach at the Center for International Education. Here in uh, the US. University of Massachusetts, yeah. yeah. And our... The center is um, is made up of approximately 50 uh, residential uh, masters and doctoral students. Um, more than half are from um, around the world. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And even those, well, everyone's from around the world at the center. They have some of them happen to be American who've lived <laughs> around the world and worked around the world. Mm. Uh, we look for people who have at least a couple of years of. Um, global education experience <laughs> uh, with different ethnic groups or, uh, mm. and um, and we, we we focus particularly on non formal and turn of education models so. mm. but some years ago four years ago five years ago one of our students um, who uh, had been in Afghanistan during the Taliban regime and actually had worked uh, and was a Baha'i. Uh, seems odd in the Taliban that she could survive, but actually worked in the in the Panjshir Valley, in Nor where, which was controlled by what some people listening to this will recognize as the Northern Alliance, which the Taliban never really took over. And in the Panjshir Valley, some community development work took place, which was actually inspired by um, a, s a certain vision of communities coming together and growing that, that are s similar to the way Baha'is see communities coming together and growing in unity and through consultation and um, through um, paying attention to the, the, the total spiritual and material needs of, of its members. Um, but in this case, it was, uh, it was, it was uh, women getting together. And um, this program um, actually spreads first slowly and then faster as an approach to grassroots community development. Mm. And since the Northern Alliance wasn't controlled by the Taliban, this was quite a popular way to go. And when the Taliban were finally um, defeated by American troops and mostly the Northern Alliance on the ground, this model became uh, something that the government, the new hardly a government, but <laughs> what was called the government began to support mm. uh, because they saw it as a way for communities to, to, to move forward. Mm. Um, in any case, this woman um, came to the center to do a master's and uh, started getting us all enthusiastic about Afghanistan, which led to a couple of trips and a set of projects. We, uh, in the Center for International Education, have been over the years quite effective at training people in community work and in adult education. And so we entered into rather small contracts to do that for uh, the Catholic Relief Services, for um, uh, a, a number of NGOs, uh, Save the Children Fund and, and others. We also entered an arrangement with the University of Kabul, the Faculty of Education, to help train their faculty uh, to um, understand and get involved in what was called accelerated learning. And these led to other projects, and the most important one until a week ago was one that I actually helped to manage, um, which, is, which is a program to provide health awareness and literacy to rural women as a part of the reconstruction of the health system in the country. The health system in the country, in trying to reach out, establish rural clinics, realized that they had no women that they could train because there were no women who were literate. Mm. And um, they needed to train women to become midwives and health workers. 
Afghanistan has the highest rate in the world of um, maternal mortality, the death of women in childbirth, mm. and the highest rate of infant mortality, uh, children dying in tri- childbirth. And the reason for this is not only 20 years of displacement and civil war, but that the ideology of um, the Mahujideen and then the Taliban was that women uh, could not see a male doctor. And since women couldn't be trained as doctors, um, they had no one to go to. So any problem the women had had to be communicated to their husbands who would then go to a medical person and say, here's the problem my wife has. They would then ask a few questions and then go back with the remedy. Well, you can imagine how that that just doesn't work. You have to examine. (laughs) And so the huge need in the country to begin to develop women as health uh, personnel if they're going to address this problem. And mm. one of the f- fundamental issues there is that women have to become health aware and literate. Mm. And so that's a program we've been contracted to do. And uh, we have to get the agreement. We have to have communities say they really want to do this. We don't impose it. They have to really ask us. And they have to ask us by having the male, the, the, the governing group on the local shura, the governing um, we get into dialogue, we talk it over with them. I mean, when I say we, the, 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 the organizations in Afghanistan we work with do this. Um, and the, the point we make is that this is a program not about women's literacy, which they wouldn't accept, or women's education or empowerment, God knows. <laughs> but we say this is, a way, this, is, this is a way for the women to become more able to look after the well-being of the, of the children and the family. Are you interested in that? And actually, as good Muslims, they are. Mm. And so this program has been accepted. Um, in fact, it's now in about 400 communities mm. with about 8,000 women. With the support, and in fact, the active support of the, me- of the men who are in charge. And there we have many stories about the women's, the transformation that this is bringing. They meet every day for two hours, uh, two and a half hours perhaps um, and it's about 15 to 20 women and they talk about their lives about their health about their children's health and they learn through the materials that are provided by the facilitators about everything from how to um, become safer in terms of the landmines that are in the area to uh, in the areas to how to de- uh, treat diarrhea to um, the the program fuses literacy and mm. health awareness, and that health awareness is very much to do with um, immediate things that can be done to improve their own health, the health of their children and, and their families and their communities. Mm. Uh, we have surveys in the community to look at areas which are a uh, likely source of disease uh, and so forth. Um, uh, that program um, is... Um, is really in succeeding <laughs> almost, I would say, in spite of us. <laughs> what I mean by we have had a lot of difficulty <laughs> because of security and all mm. kinds of things of getting in place staff and getting the training. It's been hugely challenging. Mm. We never know if we're going to be able to actually move to an area. Our local partners who can, who are or, uh, Afghani organizations who can work in an area need training and support for the the grants that we give them, how to keep accounts, um, it is hugely challenging. Um, but in spite of that, um, we find that there is more demand for this than we can provide. Mm. More communities now want to do it. Um, more women want to join, and the women who are in want to spend more time um, mm. in the in the mm. in in the programs. And it illustrates that. Given the opportunity, no, I mean, it is hard to imagine a population more abused and uh, and 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 exploited and neglected than the rural Afghani women over the last twenty years. Mm. Um, they they really have had an enormously difficult time of life, and mm. and what happens when this kind of opportunity is provided is just astounding. 
Um, and <coughs> we have just putting out a book <coughs> of the of the voices of the women um, in Afghanistan, which where they talk about this and they talk about um, what it has meant to them to be able to get together as a group and and to learn and to grow and develop. Mm-hmm. So, just as in the Baha'i faith, we. Um, the teaching of Baha'u'llah is that we can never reach world peace unless we have um, you know, full education. We certainly can't do it unless women mm. have education and opportunity and are treated as equal with men. Mm. Um, and, and the good news is we start to see this happening in Afghanistan. Um, Incidentally, uh, another just a sideline on Afghanistan, which mm-hmm. one wouldn't possibly know unless you were there, <laughs> and you wouldn't even know if you were there unless you um, look carefully. And Iran is on the western border, a big border, with Afghanistan. And actually, historically, Iran extended to the city of Herat in Afghanistan, where one of the first universities in the world was established, and it was a university for women. Mm. In about the 11th century, and it was then un- it was then in Persia, <coughs> and so the people of that part of the country have a strong affinity for um, those in Iran, and indeed the border is pretty porous. And uh, uh, during the the civil war in Afghanistan, many Afghanis went to Iran and got a higher education and a uh, secondary education, and. And today, many of them have come back. And there are also many Iranian professionals who have come to Afghanistan. Mm. And since Iran is the birthplace of the Baha'i faith and where the largest concentration of Baha'is still is in the world, although they're persecuted in Iran, many have come as professionals to Afghanistan. Mm. Now, they don't, s- they don't Announce advertise themselves, this, so, yeah. but <coughs> the fact is, is that Baha'i professionals are very good because of mm. the teachings about service, about all the, the, the teachings about the need to, to, to have the highest professional standards and excellence. They tend to do a good job mm. and they are in demand, mm. not as behind, but as, as people. And mm. so they are actually all over the country. And the faith, uh, although it is officially banned, is actually... And also in, in Afghanistan? Yeah. yeah. For the same reasons? Same reasons, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, it's true in almost all Islamic countries. Not all, but almost all. Mm. Um, but they're they're really doing such a good job. I mean, they're. But the fact is, they're contributing a lot to everything from financial systems and, uh, to education, large numbers in education, in medical services, and and so forth. So mm. that's that's really quite exciting. Mm. I, I I said just before the story about Afghanistan that. The, the Women's Health and Literacy was the largest program that the Center for International Education is involved in until last week. We've just become part of a major contract for five years to rehabilitate the faculties of education in 16 universities in the country oh, wow. uh, to help the universities better train teachers and, um, and, and help to contribute to the reform and development of the education system by providing leadership from within. Mm. And we're a lead in that, and um, <laughs> so, so that's, a, that's so you have you'll have more stories to tell when well, I come back and talk to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure how much I'll be involved in that one, cause, mm. uh, but but it, yeah. it's underway. Yeah, that, very good. So this is uh, th- I may pretty much close off. Right okay, here. I think right. this may be enough. Well, thank you very much, um, Ash. This. Is very interesting. Yeah, well, you know, the final thing I guess I want to say is that um, the attempt to incorporate into one, one's life the, the, the Baha'i teachings of, of, of the respect, I, I consider myself really having a lot of opportunity um, and, and bounty to be able to do that. Mm. Um and, and really I'm very grateful for that and continue mm-hmm. to be um, because it's the in- incorporation of the, the these these spiritual principles into the life of the world that, mm. that makes us believe that 
we should be optimistic about the future. Mm. I mean, things at a political and economic and exploitative level are, are, are very, very problematic in our world. Mm -hmm. well, we have nothing like a basis for justice that in, in, in the existing institutions, but we see at a grassroots level and, a, and in, a, in a belief that the, the spiritual principles are beginning to become manifest on uh, uh, an optimism. That's and good. We need to build from that. Mm, very good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dr. Ash Hartwell, an educator and a Baha'i from Amherst, Massachusetts, who spent many years in Africa. For information on the Baha'i faith specifically, you're welcome to visit the website www.baha'i.org. That's B-A-H-A-I dot O-R-G. Or you can call the toll-free number 1-800-22-UNITE.